Hello and welcome back to theCUBE, live at Google Next 2023. Excited to be here, it's really been a great week. We're just getting started, it feels like we've been here for an entire week already, but it's just been the quality of the guests that we keep getting on here. Not going to stop now, we got some great guests in here. We're continuing to talk to the ecosystem around GCP and Google, and this is really a lot of fun. I'm here with Dustin, uh, the two analysts on here to talk with uh, Slalom. And we're going to talk to Tony Ko, who is the Managing Director of Data and AI Business at Slalom. And we're also here with Cameron Curtis, who is the leader of Global Google Center of Excellence for Slalom. Hopefully I got that right. And we're, we're great. We're, we're, <laughs> off, we're off on a good foot already. Well done. So, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I think you know, both of us know your company and have been around this, this market for quite a while. Myself, when I was in the first party data business and we built some uh, things with you and on top of BigQuery. So, you know, kind of help us understand what really the impact has been of generative AI, oh. the data business, and how this is really focusing on your partnership with Google and how that's really helping. Wow, where do we start? Um, it's been a wild ride this year. So generative AI has just taken everyone by storm and we're no different. Um, we've been in consulting, Slalom has been in consulting for a few decades and we've always focused on high impact which is enterprise wide transformation. What generative AI has done for us is transitioned us from large transformations to exponential transitions and what I mean by that is there's three things that's generally different about generative AI. One, the pace of advancement and progress in this space is something that we've never seen before. Two, um, we're accustomed to seeing technology as something that is an exact science, and this is not. AI recognizes patterns, and now generative AI is generating patterns, so it's very probabilistic, so it's really hard to gauge the ambiguity of it. And the last is uh, unfettered access. Pretty much anyone can download a trial and start playing around and creating use cases around it. So for all of those reasons, we shifted away from large, big enterprise transformations to more agile, more um, dynamic pathing of how enterprises continue to advance their businesses and their industries. Specific to Rob, specific to uh, Google, how that shows up is once we realize the ubiquitous nature of like how much LLMs are going to be present in our lives and for our people's lives and for our clients' lives, we've made a pretty huge uh, focus on that as a what can we do to help our clients in a what we call human or fiercely human way. Applied to Google, uh, you know, we're we're not we're the smallest of the big firms or the biggest of the small, uh, but in the generative gen AI space, we're a top three uh, uh, kind of go to market with them, and we're in a top three of like educating and training our people. So it's, uh, we're seeing that pay off for our clients, but more importantly for the people, the humans in our system, right? Talk about the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah that totally makes sense. And I, I think that when you start to look about AI and these projects, there, there has to be an ROI and a business value. And I, I think we, I was at a customer panel a little bit earlier and they were talking about that, how they were putting almost data product managers or AI product managers <laughs> yeah. and business owners with those different product projects. I think one of the big themes that, you know, when I've talked with your, your teams before has been around productivity and how do you help raise the bar on productivity and have a way through. What, do you, what are you seeing from a productivity perspective with your customers? Yeah, so we, we generally think about three different layers or three horizons of how Gen AI is going to transform uh, everyone's business in different transitions. So number one is productivity, gaining efficiency. We're seeing a lot of, um, you know, anywhere from 30 to 60% efficiency or productivity gains regardless mm -hmm. of domain, function, engineering process, whatever it may be. The second horizon that we'll get into later a little bit more is how you start to channel that excess capacity to challenge conventional constraints that employees have typically worked within. Mm. And then the last uh, horizon is really getting into the changing of the essence of the entire company, why that company exists, and really understanding how to disrupt it. 
So that first horizon is where we see a lot of people taking that first step, which is very logical. How do you do um, coding faster? How do you automate processes without having to manually code in everything uh, into the entire process? And we have some really great examples that Cameron could share uh, that hey. we've done with, in partnership with Google. The duet, the duet announcement today, right? Kind of finally, it's been in the, in the wings and waiting for some time now. Uh, Cody, those personal, right, personal uh, productivity enhancements, uh, now that they're coming live and being, being applied, we're showing those up for our people and, and for our clients as well. And we have an example, like, I, I would say that the majority of development backlogs are now generated, start with the generative AI bit of work, right? Just, because it's just easier, and it takes the same, and so that's like super common, we're taking our clients through it as well. That's just productivity. Right. So from the backlog perspective, how are you, because I'm trying to piece it all together with Duet, and then the vert, uh, Vertex AI with the connectors into uh, Jira and Confluence and things. Where, where are you, with Cody in particular, because I, I don't know Cody that well. Yeah. Um, how does that apply to their backlog? How are they using that to build out a backlog? Uh, uh, Duet can help you. It's not. It's, it's not it's, necessarily Cody. Yeah, it's 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 one from the other. Where where you can create the backlog using uh, using you can use Bard. You could use you're right. It it helps you. Duet will help you do it in your in the in the workspace. Cody then helps you actually write the code and, and like proof the code. And so it's a one as a one two punch. Google's been very in thoughtful about how they are bringing these pieces together to enable the people that they're trying to enable. I think, I think it puts them in a really strong competitive uh, position. And, and this is something you're helping your clients both do themselves as well as you and your team using. So Ab it's feeding off of one another. You can think about how impactful this is going to be to the consulting field, right? Yeah. We have to be aggressively there first. And the pivots that we've done are showing up that we are. Yeah. And this is across industries at this point, and you're seeing it just, you know, because everybody needs productivity, especially in this kind of a market where they're looking to do more with less, they can't hire as fast, maybe they don't even have the skill sets, and I, I think that's where a slalom comes in, right? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Going back to the cross-industry comments, uh, you think about the different modalities that are being offered, right? Whether it's text and processing text, text uh, strings, yep. or lines of code, or video, or images, and soon getting into multimodal. So some of our um, more advanced um, clients are talking about how do you take a speech to text to code to machine commands, and now you're, you're controlling a robot, robotic arm with your natural language just by talking to it. Now that starts to get, get into physical security in addition to yeah. information security, so there's a lot of considerations around it, but the use cases that this presents across all of the different industries, whether it's legal document processing, clinical trial protocols, to uh, any sort of um, video and metadata management, um, it just cuts across the board. Yeah. It, that really hits that, um, what he was talking about earlier about the second horizon, right? The first one's productivity, the second one is changing the nature of your business. Well, that, what he's describing is, whatever's, whoever's using the robot is still manufacturing something, but the way in which they're doing it is radically changed. We have a, a client right now that we're helping understand, they have a great uh, ability to respond to emails to the CEO. Mm. Dear CEO, I've got a problem, I didn't get my thing, whatever, right? right. What they don't have, and it's a very—it's a large company, it's very complicated, right? What they don't have is a way to then make that problem be permanently fixed. So what happens is they get another email or another phone call a month later for the same problem. Using generative AI, we're able to uh, analyze the entire breadth of the problem and have a prescriptive uh, recommendation of what to do about it. So it's an exciting time of like changing how they do their business that then makes it easier for their customer's experience and it makes them a better firm. And so are those customers using that as a differentiation or as differentiating factors for you know, their own industry? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Where it shows up, you think about how uh, the generative AI, that user experience or the experience, it may, it's be transparent to you, Dustin, but it, but it sure feels a lot better sure. than an email to a CEO that just goes into the, you know, right. you never hear from, right? right. 
Now, to answer that question on the flip side, because there are companies that are looking at how do, we, how do we differentiate customer experience, employee experience, et cetera, et cetera. Some, a lot of the companies we also see, you know, that excess capacity being used to do more of the same work. Yeah. Which is, which is a missed opportunity. That excess capacity and institutional knowledge put together really puts them in a really great position to challenge, again, that conventional constraints yep. that the organizations have been working under. And, and how do you break through that? So that's a real Super push uh, where it gets really interesting and really fun for us. Yeah. yeah that would seem to be is that lead you to that next horizon, that third horizon, and what's that? Yeah, so the third horizon is really changing the essence of the company. So if, imagine you spend sufficient time in horizon two, you develop that critical thinking muscle to challenge all the constraints. And so I'll, take, I'll give you an example. The travel industry, we, we see and rely on travel industries to help manage our individual travel itineraries. And they could differentiate themselves in Horizon 2 by providing each individual their own concierge service through generative AI. Right. AI. Now, think about Horizon 3. Imagine if you could rely, give your priorities based on where you are with your family, with your community, with the people that you want to stay in contact with, and say, for the next five years, I want to make the world smaller for these group of people. Yep. And have them help you manage that itinerary together. That is changing how we would view that specific industry. And that's what we're trying to push for and, and, and materialize into reality as we explore this exciting space. Yeah. It's only going to be like 1% uh, of the companies out in the universe are going to make that pivot to a, a radical transformation of the business, right? Uh, most, but the ones that don't try are the ones that are very much going to suffer in the years to come. Yep. And in trying, they get themselves to what we call the second horizon. The, uh, we, are, we are looking for ourselves and for the companies that we support to do that, to, to aim themselves, to aim high like that, and we're helping them to do that. Right. So uh, I'd like to tell you how, how that shows up, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, Starting with kind of the open engagement of, of, and we've done several hundred like workshops, right? So what we do is consultant firms to help clients understand what it is that they want to engage in and where to go from, and where to go from there. It's the going from there that is unique and special to every firm. Well, one, one little follow up on that. How, yeah. how have you seen uh, sort of the zeitgeist change from outbound, uh, you telling your customers, hey, this AI wave is coming, to inbound, you know, oh my God, slalom, help me, uh, help me, you know, get on this train. That's a great yeah, question. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, for the past three or four years, um, a lot of, a lot more people have been paying attention to the AI space, uh, but most, mostly pushing down into the technical leaders and executives and their teams to figure out how it impacts their right. organization. Now, since you know November last year, we're seeing a lot of non-technical executives. And users, yep. I mean, a 13-year-old student or my retired post office worker mom, uh, they're all coming up with use cases and using this, So, um, which also presents a little bit of a challenge because the gap between everyone's expectations and their understanding is sure. huge. Right. And that could be a significant drop-off that really turns people off. So right. this is a really great opportunity for uh, probably everybody at this conference to capture this moment in, of attention and, and and uh, mind share, yep. and not squander it. Right. And really help educate everybody so that everybody leans in. It's a fantastic point. Yeah, and it would seem like being able to get specific language models, SLMs or segmented language models built, and hey, maybe they're off a base that was in, you know, inside of uh, Vertex AI, and you went to the model garden, you, you prune one or whatever you call it yeah. when you take one out of there. Um, I like extract that. It. Yeah, you, prune prune it. Yeah, yeah. you prune it from the garden and then you ground it, right? Then it's like replanting it. And yeah, then yeah. You make Water it specific it. To, to your... I, I would assume that's a big piece of your relationship with Google is helping people understand. To your point, it's a skill set thing. That's yeah. right. And, yeah. it's, and it's about where the data is too. And you guys go beyond just Google so you can help bring the right data to bear in that. Absolutely. The way Google is approaching uh, 
a incredible diversity of LLMs that then can be you know frozen and then get get localized to your specific cases is really an intelligent way to bring that specificity at uh, at speed and also uh, uh, you know without you don't have to go buy your own right they're very expensive models uh, so I'm pretty excited about how that enables back to like individual humans, right, to be able to, to do it themselves and have it be meaningful, right? And that, that piece of like, how we help the humans, that's what we're all here for. It's not, it's not technology for technology's sake. It's really about AI helping humans be better humans. Yeah, so with, with the last few minutes we have here, looks like, uh, Kick it to you first, Cameron. Any closing comments? And you know, how new is the center of excellence? How's it been going? You know, the relationship. Where do you see it going? So uh, we're two years in, uh, and so uh, and seeing the fastest growth across you know of a of a large partner, right? Uh, that we have going in the company, um, and we see that velocity continuing. Google has differentiated and continues to differentiate themselves in how they're approaching the market. We're seeing the pull across the breadth of our clients in, in a moment of change. So uh, it's a wild ride. I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> I, uh, I, I can't see myself doing anything else. And yeah. Tony, how do you see the, you know, how do we ensure positive outcomes for uh, clients here? Well, I, I go back to the accessibility. Everybody has access. Before, before generative AI, we always, thought about how do we make sure we have the right people so that they have a seat at the table and a voice to whatever is being created by AI products. Well now we have that. Before it was really hard to get people to actually sit at that seat because they're like AI, right. you guys take care of it. I don't know the technology, help us please. So it's really paying attention and making sure that we take the time to educate every single one of the people who are leaning in and experimenting with this and really hearing them out, it's going to be painful to educate everybody. You, you think about the layers of education, you know, whether you're prompt engineering in the actual you know, UI or you're building pipelines to help with prompt engineering or go, you're getting into fine tuning, there's going to be a lot of um, things that we have to check off the list in terms of like how we bring people along without losing them. Right. But I think that's going to be the most important part. Make sure you educate your peers, your family members, your teammates, your colleagues, everybody in any way. Yeah. Well, I really thank you guys for coming on board. It's always great to talk to Slalom, and you know, Tony and Cameron, you just, I think you hit it on the head, the nail on the head with the, it is about a process that brings them along to these different horizons and really helps them through. And I really want to thank you for joining us here on theCUBE. Uh, we're at Google Next 2023. Rob Streche with Dustin Kirkland, Lisa Martin and that other guy, John Furrier, is around here somewhere. We're going to be back. We have a lot more to come. Just a full day. We're going late, late into the evening. So stay tuned to theCUBE for all of the news that we're going to unpack the signal from the noise. Stay here.